The scientific revolution starts now. I'm John F. White. I run a YouTube channel called Crevenfold, and I'm an independent researcher in mythology, particularly specialising in Indo-European mythology. And what drives me is that the stories of the Indo-European landscape, and these include Vikings, uh, these include Germanic tribes, the Romans, the Greeks, Anatolia, the Turks, the Hindus, all these have creation myths. And all these creation myths are linked. And when I found that out, and they all have the same characters in there, they all have a, a similar story of sacrifice, a similar cosmogony, so how the world is created, how the universe comes to be. I thought, there's no way these stories started up independently. There's got to be a link. And I slowly investigated and realised that other people had seen this too and, and wrote about it, and that information wasn't available freely. So a couple of years ago, when we had the pandemic, uh, I was working at the university, and I noticed students weren't having a great experience. We went into a blended learning and then remote learning. And I thought, well, now's my opportunity to teach online, to to give some of that back, to, to let this information isn't necessarily easily available, um, be available to people. And it seems to have caught on and caught a lot of people's imaginations. And it seems to be a thing that you probably don't realise you're interested in it until you hear it. And you think, oh, I like the sound of that. Tell me more. And so I, I particularly investigate the stories behind the stories, I call them. So where we hear myths about dragon slaying or creation or death or, or particular characters in these myths, I try and find out the stories behind them and what were what created that story, that created that myth. And then we, there's scientific method to allow us to determine the source of that myth and where it comes from and its age as well. And so we can have a probabilistic idea of the age and source of many of these old myths we know about. And again, some of those are very surprising. And we are talking stories that are over 10, 20, 30, even 50,000 years old. And we feel quite confident that, that is the case. And that's a longer span of time into the past than I think most people think is possible. Because if you look at the earliest seeds of civilization, that's mm. Gobeki Tepe. And that's, what, 12,000 years ago, the end of the Younger yes, Dryas. And it seems like whenever we talk to people who are within the academy, who are looking at these very, very ancient sites, there's this sense that, well... There wasn't really much before that. But if you're tracing these myths back to, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago, it suggests that there very much was something that was already foundationally human. Well, exactly. foundationally cultural and so, like civilization oriented almost, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a defi it depends how you define a civilization, but mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't have rock buildings. Yeah. No, we don't. They're about 15,000 years old rock buildings. But yeah, so that's one of the things that drove me. How do people find this out? And we find there are common stories. And, and we, can, we can talk about many of these as we go on today. Um, so a creation myth is, it, that's an easy one in terms because there's lots of investigation done. So for example, as I hinted at, the Vikings have a story where creation starts with a giant or primordial being called Ymir, and he is killed by Odin uh, and Odin's brothers. And with the body of Ymir, they build the world. Okay. And then we see a very similar story in Iran, uh, in Persia, in Hindu mythology. We have Manu and we have Yama and we have Yama as well in Persia. Uh, and in Germania uh, by Tacitus, he writes about uh, Twisko. So the, and, and Yama, Yama, Ymir all mean twin, Twisko means twin as well. So you've got this twin figure always being sacrificed, always being used to create the world. And we know through genetic studies that the Indo-Europeans are about six to 8,000 years old. So that's one story. And if they're all telling that, you think, oh, that must have started that long ago. Okay. But we can actually have older stories than that. So one of the most fascinating ones to me um, is the ferryman of the dead. 
So you have uh, um, Sharon of Greek myths. So everybody looks at him. He, he looks a little bit like the Grim Reaper, but punts along a little boat across the river Styx. Um, so we see stories of people dying and going to another world, all in North America, partly in South America, all across Eurasia. Now, when we start seeing stories that are spread like that for Eurasia and North America, we have a feeling, oh, they could be older than 20,000 years old, because the only way that story is going to jump into North America is when there was a land bridge between Asia and North America, which is around the last ice age, 20,000 years ago. And what we see is that there is a tale, um, Oedipus, of which in, in Greeks where he um, he loses his wife to a snake bite and he goes to hell to try and get her back. And uh, Hades says, yeah, you can, you can take her, um, but don't look back when you leave hell, because if you do leave the underworld, she'll be remain here forever. And he just about to leave this underworld, looks back to make sure his wife's behind him and she disappears forever. And they tell almost the same story in First Nation American tribes. Almost the same story from east to west coast. Now, is that coincidence or is there, is there a source there? So as I say, I'll talk about probability quite a lot and or is it a con- or is it convergence too, right? Like uh, if you just isolated a bunch of people who didn't have any knowledge of the past and plopped them down somewhere on earth, would they converge on similar stories? That's is- what, exactly. And that's the thing. So that's a very good point. I'm going to get asked that a lot. So if it's a creation myth, for example, they wouldn't come up with the same name necessarily. So we see Manu and Jimo a lot in Indo-European mythology, man and his twin, and Trito, who is the first human warrior, and that means three. So you have this one, two, three character always. But in the um, fairy man myth, it's like you get, you get this story about crossing the river, which is very consistent going to the underworld. But the snake, there's a snake bite in it as well. Why are they killed by a snake all the way from yeah, across Eurasia and North America? It's always a snake bite. They always go to hell and they always fail at bringing their, their wife back. What do you and think is like, the not, significance of the snake? Oh, well, I could talk about significance of snakes. That's a whole, that's a whole different category of myth. <laughs> um, yeah, humans have forever been afraid of snakes. Yeah, it's it's inherent within our genes. Or uh, so, and that's the reason why dragons exist. Snakes, um, and I can tell you about that. If you want to dive straight into that? So, uh, well, you- let's let's not let's not get too uh, too scattered. I think we should stay with the okay. fairy man myth until we we delve to sufficient depths. So, so there is the emergence of the same story from culture to culture of a particular collection of events. There is the snake bite, there is the ferryman, there is the river, there is the descent. And, and s- go ahead. There's a description of the ferryman as well, who's always an old man with a long grey beard. And that's always there. Which sounds pretty standard for you know, someone who wants to think of his death, but that's always there as well. And we see that from Viking myths all the way across into, say, into North America. I mean, there's some aspect of it that has to be just inherently a result of what it's like to be alive, right? So I think about this all the time. Shaila and I will go into the woods and we go to this river that's near us. And I'm struck by how similar a landscape is from place to place before humans show up on it and start to build stuff. Your restrictions are very similar. Your concerns are very similar. No matter where you are, you need water, you need food, you need a space that has shade where you can build your houses. And Mm -hmm. so on some level, it does make sense that you would start to tell similar stories from place to place because everybody gets old. Everybody's afraid of snakes. Everybody has to cross rivers and and the sky is unpredictable to some extent and predictable to other extents, much like gods or something, right? Yeah. It, like we were watching these thunderstorms roll in and it, it was very, we just had this realization that it made a lot of sense that you would, well, actually a thunderclap went off like literally over our head and it was, we were just having a conversation. It was like, whoa. And it was, and, and you had this sense of, oh, I could see how you would think that was a god. Like it makes mm-hmm. sense. Inherent, yeah, there's some something is there. So, so part of me would say, in, so sort of almost turn that on its head and say, 
that's why these myths have persisted because they're easy to remember because it's easy to apply them to the landscape and the environment. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to tell the story as you go mm. rather than have the same story pop up in, I think it was about 40 different First Nation tribes. Demystify Sci podcast is supported by viewers like you. We don't have sponsors. We do not have external interests that are paying for our daily bread. And so if you like what we do, if you'd like to see the show grow, consider coming over to patreon.com slash demystify sci. You get all of the episodes that we release each week on Saturday. You get to join our weekly patron chats where we talk about the episodes, but we also talk about the sorts of things that run underneath the topics we talk about on the show because we have a group of really dedicated listeners that are scholars of their own right. And so our weekend chats are a chance to come together with a group of people that are interested in exploring deeper and furthering their understanding of nature. So for just a couple dollars a month at patreon.com slash demystify sci, you can help support the project. If you don't have any cash to spare, that's totally fine. You can tell your friends about the podcast because that helps us grow. You can leave a comment because that helps with the algorithm. You can subscribe to the channel. You can join our Facebook group. You can join our Discord group. So consider helping us grow in any way that you can. We found this story. Um, and, and and we actually told by the language, so how we analyze the myths, there's different ways, but when we actually get to the structure of the myth, we look at the words used and we often see the same mythogen, we call it the same sort of set of words or sentence appear mm. in the myths. And, and we can tell with language evolution how it would have flowed back and we can see the First Nation tribes, we can actually trace it back to, uh, I think it, there's some Inuit and, and to Siberia, the, the same language, the same mythogens. Again, and so, so we have a, sort of a, almost like a stack of confidence levels from uh, genetically did people migrate that way um does the architecture there's or, or the archaeology suggests there was some uh, cultural transference or, or dispersal taken in that way uh, and then you know is the language evolution allowed that to happen and then do the words within the myth suggest that there was the same myth being taken on so we have a, a number of different levels of probability and we stack them all together and that's why i tend to say it is this is probabilistically what happened i mean because we, we never know for sure but out of all the options it, it feels the most likely because of all these things put together hmm. and and what do you think that the myth informs us of do you think that it's of something that's still relevant to us today which is why people tell it or is it that people enjoyed the story and maintained it simply for aesthetic reasons no i think death is probably one of the most emotional things that ever happened to humans i think it's a thing that kicked off religion to be honest uh, and belief and i think people wanted to know what happened when you died you know because there's this thing where you're left with a dead body I mean, births different. A body comes out of a, a woman, and there's a process there, and, and and you go on living. But when you're dead, what's happened to your soul, or whatever you want to call it, your spirit? It must go somewhere. And, and people think, well, where does it go? And so we start seeing what you could interpret as a view of another world. You know, people going into caves to perform ritual. Why are they going into caves? Are they trying to get into the earth to get to this other world and when we see all sorts of myths and certainly from our early understanding of this underworld or this other world it wasn't like hell i mean hell hell hadn't been uh, sort of invented we, we hadn't got around judgment at this point judgments came maybe around three thousand years ago four thousand years ago in persia we started to see that but before then we didn't have it you just died and you went to a place and it was a place we used to see evolve a place which we think of paradise, but it isn't. It's a place which is timeless and without hunger. Um, yeah, and, and there's no need for food and there's no need for heat. But what you also don't necessarily realize is there's no need for, for cold and no need for, you, know, you don't, you don't feel like that hungry or you don't need the, the food. You know, it's a place of nothingness. Is that how they better describe it in a way that sounds like paradise? And you see this all, all a lot in, in literature. So I, mean, I think that's what's happened. It's so interesting because I often think about how the lot of humans, the lot of all animals, is to spend your life in search of sustenance and shelter. 
And so the idea that the first myths were about a place where you could go where you no longer had to worry about that, it's almost like that's this is this is going to sound silly, but it's almost like it's the first vacation that you can take. Because, well, in a way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Well, because I mean, that's that's the condition. That's the condition that we still haven't ever managed to escape from because people talk about you know we'll build a post-scarcity society where we'll have enough surplus that nobody has to worry about staying warm or having enough to eat and that's this dream that i think that humans have always been striving for and it makes sense that the earliest myths would have been about how you could achieve that place and that death was the 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 moment where you could finally enjoy that but I yes. wonder if it, because in the Christian myths, death becomes something that is, you know, there's this moment of judgment, like you said. There is, yeah. And then there's also this idea where, okay, so you could go to paradise if you're good, but you can't kill yourself to go to paradise early because that's a deadly sin. Right, yes. Is there a place where it emerges that you that there's something wrong with trying to get there early? Yes, well, sort of. So uh, there's, there's two things to this. So first off, humans thought we should be immortal. So, so they ask themselves, why do we die? And that's a very interesting question. There's myths around that. So we find in Africa, and we can trace these out of Africa, myths about the moon and the snake having stolen our immortality. And the reason for that is that the snake sheds its skin and, and the moon disappears and comes back. You, know, you, have, you have these new moons and, and that. And so you see lots of stories about that. And this is interesting because we see how does the snake take our immortality? And there's a couple of stories. And one of the stories is that uh, humans, a uh, human is lost somewhere and needs to find help and, and persuades this snake to help them and the snake gives them food so they, they can eat and and carry on but by taking the food the snake wants something back and it takes that immortality um, but you also see it where the snake gives knowledge to humans such as knowing how to procreate and, and then in return takes them, which is really interesting if you then go to the bible and look at the story of adam and eve and the snake and the tree of knowledge and the snake gives an apple to Eve, and we all think it's about sin, but actually, it's, if we look it back at the, the original myth, it's about losing immortality. Mm. So that, that's that's how I interpret that. Anyway, that's that's where that myth has come from. So yeah, so that's that's how we think why we die. But in terms of what happens in judgment, that came about through uh, Zoroastrianism. So uh, so Zoroastrian. Uh, f- Started uh, around Iran, we saw Asta, and so Asta was quite a, a clever person. If, I mean, whether he was real or not, you know, there's still a little bit of debate about that. But he had this view that the world wasn't made by a benevolent God. Because if the world was made by a benevolent God, it would be good. But there's actually as much bad as good. And because there's as much bad as there is good, the world was created by a good and a bad spirit. So he he really put the dualism into myth. And we see lots of myths, even older creation myths, have dualism applied to them. So, so uh, and I, I, we can touch on this later, but a very brief example is this is uh, one of our oldest creation myths is about a, a earth diver where a duck sits on the sea, dives down to the bottom sea to get some mud and brings it back up to the top of the sea. And when it does, the mud hits the air, land is created. And when that goes into, or like that travels up into Siberia, changes into the flood myth we all know of, which I can talk about uh, later. Uh, and, but then when it comes back into Persia, uh, they then say, oh, no, it's not a duck. It's the devil that has to do that, and God watches on. And you see that then myth travel into Europe. And the um, Ugrins, so, uh, so the Uls, uh like migrate towards Hungary and that, and you actually see in Eastern Europe this this earth diver myth, as you call it, but with dualism in it, where it's been added. But then you also see a more well-known story is uh, Cyrus, 
Cyrus the Great from Persia when he uh, conquers the Near East. Shortly after that, the people in the Near East who are writing the Bible, the, the, the Jews, they start writing about hell because the God, uh, before they have just been conquered by someone who believes in gods that have this judgment and they and it's perceived that they think, oh, we need gods like that. Our God probably has judgment too. And so they take you know, what happens is that if you're conquered, you take the good thing from the gods of the people conquering you, you know, to make you more powerful. And we see that. So that's how judgment starts to spread and how, in effect, hell comes to be. We're kind of jumping around in, ti- in, in the timeline of all of this, but how much of religion is state crafting? Because it seems to me that if you provide a narrative where death is this paradise, that you now have the motivation to have people fight and die or work in the fields and die, right? You have the ability, there's something manipulative about it, whether that's employed or not or fundamental or not. Because if you go back before religion, I feel like you have this tradition of ancestor worship that's that's quite, and this is maybe separate from mythology, which may have occurred alongside this, but it seemed like the real uh, people really bowing down before something was towards their ancestors, if you go really far back. It's, and there's even a tradition of that still, I think, in like the Balkan areas where people will sort of do the Christian religion, but it's really about ancestor worship. Mexico is kind of the same way, where it's like they do mm-hmm. adopt the Christian churches and the rituals, but most of them don't really care much about the traditional Christian stuff. They're actually just using it as a platform for this ancestor worship still. And so I just wonder how much how much of the introduction of religion and wrapping, weaving it together with mythology into something was about state crafting and about, you know, unifying your people to maybe do things that they wouldn't do otherwise from like a, a top down perspective of the, the lorded class. I see that very clearly with things like the Roman Catholic church. I mean, that is, you know, we're, we're in a hands down on, on doing that. And that's how Christian conversion happened across Europe. I mean, conversion wasn't done nicely back then. It basically, it felt like the church would agree to supply various leaders of regions with armies and money if they then converted. And obviously, once you had churches everywhere, they could take a tithe or whatever from the population and give it back to the church. And so there's, there's some good business model there because the church, well, it is quite a wealthy organisation. So we see that there in... Other places, or, or earlier on, I, I think what you see happen is that leaders pronounce themselves as gods, and that's how they make that link, rather than, in effect, allow the religion to take over, they become the religion. Mm. So you see, like, pharaohs do that, and, and, and you, you, you see it all the time. So kings of England, where we see that um, even after things like um, the Anglo-Saxon conquest and conversion to Christianity, you go nine uh, places back in, in the, their family tree, and there's Woden there. So they are born from a god, and that, that was quite important, some divine hierarchy. And we actually see that. So at what we call the Neolithic farmers or the early European farmers as they come across uh, in, into Europe. So about 8,000 years ago, so about 6,000 BCE, the, these farmers come along with a creation myth, and the creation myth of the Near East tends to have an awful lot of family feuding going on to, 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 to start out. So you see two primordial beings, and they have some children, and then the children get together with the mother to kill the father. Then one of the children will sleep with the mother to have a child, and that child will then kill the mother and sleep with his sister. And 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 this is all done almost to establish a a divine hierarchy so that when you do finally get the gods you worship, they have a decent backstory to, in effect, evidence why they are the gods. Yeah, they're not just made up. And so yeah, we see that. And so I think you find leaders then slide themselves in. And don't forget, back then there is no writing. There is there's very little drawing. So no one really remembers two generations ago. So no one can remember that your great-granddad wasn't a god. Yeah, he must have, must have really got. So, I'm sure there's a bit of play on that. But yeah, that's that's where you find the ruling. So the leader becomes the god 
And they have four people following. And also, it also, if I if I could just interject, I think that it's mm. not entirely sinister too, because there's something valuable about orienting your leadership towards some divine purpose at, in its best case scenario, right? It's like mm -hmm. our leaders today aren't oriented towards anything divine or anything even approximating, <laughs> honestly, Sorry. really concerned for the normal person, the poor person on the street, which is like 99% of us essentially. And so it's like, you can see how that can both be creepy and corrupting but also makes a lot of sense in terms of what you would want as a civilization in a way and it's quite interesting so what we find in the indo-european mythology is that so, so is the cosmogony happened so we well i talked about this primordial being 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 uh, killed and in effect his body parts being used to create the earth what we also see in that mythology is that some of the body parts are used to create humans and what we see is that the head is used to create priests, the torso is used to create warriors, and the legs are used to create the providers, so farmers. And you have this almost, I don't want to put it a class system, but there is this hierarchy of order. But what you find is that the king, so so the, the, the primordial being who was killed, sacrificed, was actually a primordial king, um, but it, all his body parts from his head, torso, and legs were used to make the king. So because the torso is also used to build the world and you have this king figure made from all parts of the torso, you can this, get this interesting alignment where that the king is a king because he understands how priests think, he understands how warriors think, and he understands how providers think because he's got a part of them in his body. But also he is connected with land because the land is made by all those same parts of the body of that primordial being. So we see that if the king gets injured, if the king loses an arm or a leg, the land suffers because, in effect, the king is part of the land, the land is part of the king. And so we, we, we see, certainly in Western Europe, the fact that if a king is injured, he should say goodbye to him because the land, the people do not want the land to suffer. Mm. So the king gets moved on and a new king gets put in place. Or if the land does suffer and the king looks healthy, then obviously the king's doing something else wrong he's the way he's ruling isn't right so the king goes again so actually being king wasn't as you know a, a great deal as you, you might think because people had this link of linking it to the land and linking it to the people but mm. that, that's how that cosmogony works I, I really like that pattern that you know, their ancestors certainly in, in Europe created with that and it, you get that in Indo Iran too uh, but it's more spiritual rather than physical. So a king couldn't pass on his genes to down below. It was a spiritual thing. So when someone died there, or if they behaved badly, so we talked about judgment, uh, that their spirit would leave their body and go to someone else. And in India, it gets to a point where if you die, even if you've been a saint you know, or, or saintly, if anybody who's preparing your body to go to the underworld has sinned, then you don't go to the underworld. It all rubs off like that. So you start seeing this nice, sort of, almost like an ecosystem of, of beliefs all linking together. We were talking to an archaeologist that was studying the very early Mesoamerican kingdoms, and he mentioned, I can't remember which archaeologist this was, but I remember him saying that the life of a king in these, in these civilizations wasn't what we think of as like the life of a king today, like the life of a billionaire or something. It wasn't this life of leisure. In fact, there are, they were so indebted to the ritual and to the ceremony that it was essentially a, a very large burden on their lives. Like they were tasked with ceremony from dawn till dusk most days, and they were essentially a mascot, right? They were, of course, housed and, and fed the best and all of these things, but they were very busy with staying in communion with the land and the people. And there was this huge spiritual responsibility upon this leadership. Uh, did you, do you see that in other cultures as um, well? So in Indo um, European, you, you, you get a sort of split between the priest and the king, the sovereign, well, they use a sort of sovereign figures. So the priest is almost as powerful as the king uh, in, in, in many of the cultures. Uh, but the priest doesn't necessarily have the connection with the people because he isn't built from all the body parts. He's just built from the head of the primordial being. So, so you see that difference there. 
Um, but but you're right, it is a thankless task almost being a king. If, if there's a battle, you have to be out front. You know, if there's a war, you have to make you have to make the judgments, calls. So yes, it is a it is a job. It is very much a you know, a full time job. The priest figures are interesting. So when we talk about this creation myth of the Indo Europeans and this Manu and Jimo, and Jimo is the sacrifice one would have been the king. Manu is actually the priest figure. So what happens when Manu sacrifices Yimo and creates the world and creates the people? The story goes that Manu comes down onto the world and teaches people how to sacrifice. And sacrifice is a huge thing in Indo-European culture. So what we see there is that it was very much what you give to, or what you take from the land, you have to give back. So if you take cattle from the land, you have to somehow sacrifice cattle to the gods so they're providing them back. If, if when someone is born, in effect, they're born from the land. So the primordial being when they die, and, and we see this in Christian texts and other texts too. Uh, so this Indo-European cosmogony has has travelled even as far as, as China. We see that um, the bones or, or his bones were made the rocks, his hair became the grass, his blood became the sea, his flesh became the earth. And so when people are born, in effect, they take a piece of the earth from the world and they take a piece of the sea and they take a piece of grass and that builds that person up when they die, they then go back. But sometimes you need to, in effect, remind the gods to to help nourish the world. So you, you see this sacrifice. And actually, that, this is a very important ritual. So if you ever sit around the dinner table, let's say at Thanksgiving, um, you Americans, you probably had this thinking there. That is pretty much an Indo-European human sacrifice ritual happening there mm. in the 21st century. And, and I'll ex- explain it. So what happened is that th- these cultures had a number of different tribes. And rather than the tribes fight each other, which they would do occasionally, they did try and ha- live this egalitarianism, sort of, or have this egalitarianism structure around them, so they be sort of equal. But when it came to sacrifice, what they had to do is at least once a year, we believe they recreated this creation myth. Okay, so the creation myth, so I've missed out a a sort of part where you had the Manu and Nemo. In the Indo-European creation myth, you also had a giant cow. And that's because the Indo-Europeans were pastoral farmers. They liked farming with herds of cattle rather than growing crops. And so the cow to them was the most important thing Ever. You could literally use every part of its body. Uh, you could even steal its baby's food. <laughs> you know, you could you know, eat the babies if you wanted. It was, it was a, you know, there, it had to be a gift from the gods. It was so perfect an animal. So every year they recreated this myth, and that meant sacrificing a person and sacrificing an animal. And what they did, or what we perceived they did from the text, we can sort of draw clues out of, is that they gave parts of the head to uh, those who were the leaders or the best tribes or the, the leaders within the tribes. They gave the bodies, parts of the body to the warriors and they gave the legs to, to the farmers for both the man and, and the, the animal and, and obviously left bits for given to the gods, probably for, for on a pyre or, or something like that. So, yeah, that's that's how like, they sort of kept the the world in order for them. And that's why the, why the priest figure was important because the priest had to, in effect, perform these rituals perfectly because if he gave the wrong person a bit of the head, you know, or gave him a bit of the leg rather than a bit of the head, it's, it's not going to be well liked. They'll probably have to redo the ritual again. So we see this balance between a king maybe heading up the armies and, 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 and keeping the tribe strong and safe and the priest enabling the ritual part of things. So I think, to answer your question, in the Indo-European space, culturally, um, the responsibility was split. So it's probably a slightly easier life than being a king in Mesoamerica. But um, still, I wouldn't want to be one. (laughs) Can you elaborate on the linkages between the human sacrifice ritual and Thanksgiving? So, yeah, so it's, it's about, at the so, so imagine the group of you, you're all equals in a tribe, in effect, So, apart from the, the king. But when, when you come down to sacrifice, when the sacrifice actually happens, you're all equal. No one has a, a higher place than the person about to be sacrificed. 
Okay. And so when, when they are sacrificed, you then, for a moment, you order, you know, a hierarchy is created. And this is quite interesting. So it's like there always has to be a hierarchy in society, even if you try to make it equal, because someone has to get the food first and someone has to get the best bit of food. So you see this happening. So that's dished out. And when that is dished out, then everybody eats. So in effect, if you're at dinner, you know, who, who carves the meat and who gets served first? Mm. There, in effect, you are introducing a hierarchy to your dinner table as part of this custom of a meal. I wonder if you've traced the extinguishment of this obligation to the land, because I feel like around the time of, you know, Francis Bacon, let's say, so like Enlightenment period, there was this idea that emerged that nature was not something that humans were obligated to, but instead it was something that humans were entitled to. Yeah, that's the Industrial Revolution. Did that To me, the Industrial Revolution is where we could take more than we had to give. So so as when I talk about the European sort of culture, which is you give what you, you take, you never took more than what you wanted. The Industrial Revolution was the time where we could actually and the agricultural revolution as well, sort of along just before that, it was a time where you actually created more than we needed. And so you took more than you had to have. And I think that is where things broke. You know, it's a certain reliance on religion or, or we became less, re- yeah, some, I think people necessarily didn't have to believe in the gods quite so much then because you saw machines and and these sort of agricultural units Sort of farming these immense crops and the like. So to me, that is where that happened. And uh, uh, there's a a great author, Bruce Lincoln, um, who went to Chicago, professor of Chicago religious history. Uh, he 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 wrote a brilliant paper about this, uh, and I think that it might have been part of the sacrifice paper actually. And he he talks about um, you know exactly this that that the the revolution we, at the moment we started to take more than. Or, or we made more than we needed and took more than we should have is when, yeah, we, we had to made a real disconnect with nature. Do you have a sense of whether or not the beliefs changed first to allow that or if they followed the technological improvement? Well, that would be a personal opinion rather than a... Um, I would say... For a majority of people, the beliefs changed after. But you also need people who don't believe to make the change. Mm. You know, uh, that's what I'd say. You know, someone, I mean, I, I don't know how, I don't, I don't know the beliefs of, of many of the inventors. I've never really looked into it. But it would be interesting to see you know, when when electricity you know, became probably or, or Stevenson improving the railway or whatever. Um, did they did they think they were breaking God's rules, the, the rules of Mother Nature? I don't know. I don't know, but probably people around them were like, oh no, you can't do this, and they changed after. So I think it takes perhaps more uh, liberal believers to to make the change, and and others will then follow. Yeah, because there's there's an aspect to belief in general which is. Uh, it puts a limit on what you can do and what you should do and what you're allowed to do. And so I can, I can imagine the situation where as you begin to shift your beliefs about what is right, that you then begin to enter into progressively more and more compromised positions when it comes to nature, because you start to believe, well, no, these old ideas of our relationship to nature were the result of some kind of primitive limitation on our technology and so as we improve our technology then that releases us from the obligations that we have to the old gods but technological progress happened for you know a long time there are thousands of years that culminated in the industrial revolution (laughs) and i wonder if you see a shift in the myths across these different technological eras like stone age copper age bronze age um, you see it with the horse. So mm-hmm. the Indo-Europeans are most famous not only for uh, 
farming the cattle, but also were the, they're the ones to really make use of the wheel and to ride the horse. So as soon as you can ride a horse and take a lot of things with you somewhere a long way, you become immediately, you have immediate advantage over any other tribe or culture near you. And so that's why the Indo-Europeans spread over such a large space so quickly. That and they brought the plague with them, which the early European farmers never had encountered because they didn't have so much access to animals. Um, but, mm. but when the Indo-Europeans came along, you know, they started trading with the early European farmers in Europe. And then we see those farmers, those Indo-European farmers have, have, uh, get the plague and, and a lot of them get wiped out. And so uh, that's how we achieved that. Um, so what the beliefs changed? So the beliefs changed because of the horse, because the cow started to disappear and the horse became the object that must have been given by a god. And then there are some amazing horse sacrifices. So in, in India, there's a particular horse sacrifice that takes a year. So the king basically chooses a pure white horse and lets the horse roam free for a year. And wherever the horse roams, the king will claim those lands. Okay, And so that may result in a number of wars or whatever. And then after the year happens, the horse takes part in a, a ritual behind closed doors with the king's wife. And then the horse is sacrificed. <laughs> um, really? It, really. That's uh, crazy. Yes. But I, I, I do, is there any sense of, of how that came to be the ritual? I don't know. Perhaps one king had a particular thing going on. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and I don't know if it's anything physically happened between two living beings, because you often see about the phallus being uh, removed. But I don't know if it's pre or post. There isn't a, a detailed enough description to say what's going on. But it's mm-hmm. assumed it was more an, a ritual act rather than a, a, a physical act. You know, you, you, you played out. Yeah, you you role played it maybe rather than actually performed it. I don't know. I mean, I, so. I express some credulity about this, but I do remember going down the rabbit hole now that I think about it and seeing that this copulation with animals is actually pretty common in the ancestral record. More so than you probably want to believe. Yes. Well, there's actually a guy that we've been meaning to talk to who, uh, his name's Eugene McCarthy, and he has a theory for human evolution, which is that the human lineage actually descended from a primate pig hybrid. And I haven't dug into this, but he has a load of genetic evidence and it's just, it, it would dovetail no nicely. Has seen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not a geneticist, uh, so uh, yeah, i I'll sit on the fence until I, I hear what they say. Um, <laughs> yes, but yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, animals, I, mean, I, I think, and t- I would say even 40,000 years ago, I don't think humans really considered themselves much different to animals. You know, they, they consider, you know, if, if they're sitting in the cave, maybe they have fire or whatever, they, and they see a herd of horses running by. They wouldn't necessarily think, you know, consciousness wise, you know, we're really different to them. We're just animals taking part in life. And something changed to make that happen. And that's interesting because no one can really say exactly what it is. But what we see around that time is a, a burst into life of the creative arts. So at that time, that's, a, that's when we first see a sculpture of an imagined object. Hmm. So unless you consider jewellery or flint tools, imaginary objects, but there a lion man was carved. So um, it's uh, the lion man of Lone Minch. You may have seen pictures of it. It's about 12 inches tall. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the corner. I've got one in the corner there. Uh, but it's a, it's, it looks, they call it a lion man. And some people think it's a man wearing a lion's outfit, but it is it, to most, it looks like a lion man hybrid. So the first thing we've ever imagined that, that doesn't exist, someone's carved out. Not only that, that's the first ever example we see of a humanoid figure being carved. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's, 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 and then shortly after that, you start seeing Venus figures being carved. When, when was the lion man, by the way? About 40,000 years ago, mm. 35 to 40,000 years. So we start, and then we start seeing Venus figures in very similar locations, 
and slowly that split. But around 40,000 years ago, we also start seeing cave art, including figurative things, so, so animals and, and people. But that's in Indonesia, I think that starts happening. So, so it's around that sort of time humans are, 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 are seeing something a bit different. Um, although the fact it's happening to very different places doesn't suggest it's genetic. But perhaps that there is some genetic thing going on there. I don't know that they've made us think slightly differently, or maybe just someone. I don't know. I had, I had an idea. <laughs> you know, uh, or oh, we just haven't found it. Perhaps they've been carving them for fifty thousand years, and we just haven't found another one mm. because it's really hard to find these things if they're made of anything other than stone. Yeah, that actually opens an interesting line of question, which is the difficulty of tracing these stories back with sufficient substance because like you said that there's not a ton of writing there's not a ton of artifacts when you start to go back back. yes after six thousand years or before six thousand years there's nothing like that so we have to rely as i say there's this what we call phylogenetics which is a combination of dna archaeology uh, linguistic evolution and and mythogen analysis but I, I, I can tell you the oldest story in the world that we know of. And by that, I mean, we know parts of stories that are very old. But we actually have a very good idea of a story that starts from sort of like a once upon a time to a happy ever after, that whole thing. And I'll tell you how we know it's old. So it's called the Cosmic Hunt. And it involves uh, some people chasing an animal that's called the sun in its antlers, like maybe a deer or something. And so they chase this animal over the course of a year, and eventually kill it, and the sun is released. And you know, the year starts again, and that's the cycle of the sun. And the thing is, we see this story in Europe associated sort of with deers and with elk, or, uh, and it's linked to the Ursa Major, or the Plough, the Big Dipper star system. And each star in that has a particular role to play in the story. Now, this story is also told elsewhere in the world. It's told in Siberia, for example, and they use exactly the same stars and exactly the same roles, such as a hunter and a person who cooks and and uh, one person's carrying pots and there's there's one star in the Big Dipper which has a, a minor star next to it. You can't see with the naked eye unless you really look. Uh, and that's going on Siberia. But the sun isn't caught by... Um, uh, at the end, is he's caught in the tusks of a mammoth. And then we see the same story uh, in North America. But this time the bear has grabbed the sun. And when the bear's killed, his blood sprays across the land, and that's why all the trees go brown in autumn. So mm-hmm. blood has poured across the land. So, and there's various versions of this story, with mainly with Ursa Major, but there are some with other stars, and there are variations of, of this story to, to admit. But the main gist of the story is that Come the winter time, the the animal dies, um, or it does, or the dead deer, deer dies, or no, the bear dies. But in the Siberian story, the mammoth hides in water and comes out again. Now the animal itself is represented by Ursa Major. So what we were puzzled is if we see this story go across North America, so I think okay, it could be over twenty thousand years old, but if it's why are they telling about this animal dying or hiding underground when it dies? That doesn't make sense. There's Ursa Major's high in the sky. Now, we, the, the scientists who looked at this used some astronomy software and went back 40,000 years. And Ursa Major in winter isn't high in the sky 40,000 years ago. Mm. It's, on the, it's below, just below the horizon. Mm. And it's like if they're telling this story of that animal with that constellation, dying and, and hiding either under water or on the ground, then there's a really good chance this story is 40,000 years old. So, Yeah, it strikes me that the, the stars must have been the Netflix of the ancestors, <laughs> right? They're, they're outside at night. This is probably the only time of day that everyone's gathered together and is capable Absolutely. of reinforcing the stories of their ancestors. And what better you know, visual aid than the stars above you. Exactly. And of course, no matter where you are on, on Earth, well, they're a little different depending on where you are on Earth, but essentially you have access to the same palette 
of visual symbols. Yeah, same same movie screen wherever yeah. you are in the Northern Hemisphere. Is, Absolutely. Are there places where the tracing of mythological stories conflicts with the established narratives for humans radiating across the planet? Like, do you, because I, I imagine the, 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 the question that I'm asking is that we have a story where people come across the Bering Strait, they end up in North America, they travel their way down through North America, they end up in South America, but occasionally you will find alternative tellings, which is that, okay, well, perhaps the Polynesians came to South America first across the ocean. Yes. And so um, I, I wonder if you've seen this in, in myths where there's, there's the transference of stories that must have happened not according to the sort of the land bridge story. Um, n- nothing easy. The, 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 I think the one that surprised me the most is the rainbow serpent. So the rainbow serpent is the serpent that creates life in Australia. And many people would like to believe that's the oldest story in the world. You know, so travel to Australia with the uh, First Nation Australians. But from our evidence and what we can gather, we don't think it actually got to Australia to about 12,000 years ago. Mm. Um, and, be- beca- and because we sort of migrate from Indonesia down as a sort of second wave rather than an original wave of that. So that surprises me um, a little, but that's really about it. I mean, the the only other sort of surprising thing, I guess, I know, is uh, the origins of Odin or Woden, who is the god of the, the Vikings, chief god of the Vikings, most people know him as. Um, so most people consider him an Indo-European god. But actually, his name, and this is through the work of Anatoly Lieberman, uh, his name is associated with the leader of the wild hunt. And, the, the, and so and that's a, a term called Wothu in Proto-Indo-European. And um, the wild hunt almost certainly was going on long before the Indo-Europeans were established. I mean, the wild hunt is basically the premise of wind and and thunderstorms and that happening and, and noises in a wood happening at night. And that must have been happening as long as we were hunting gatherers. There's the story. So it seems like people like Odin are, are far, far older in terms of part of their concept. I mean, Odin is much more complicated than that as multiple layers added to him as he's travelled into Scandinavia. Um, but yeah, you start seeing hints that some stories are actually perhaps older and, and tell a tale of things travelling um, that you wouldn't normally expect but yeah there's nothing that i would say is is shocking or, or anything like that but that much difference no we know our genetics i trust our geneticists so you know if they say it's migrated this time i'm happy to to take that what's the story of the rainbow serpent well the rainbow serpent comes from the dragons so the story of dragons and um some of this so this is a uh, work by the hoy because I see you noting their names. So De Hoy is, is the uh, chap who, who did this study and, and the Liquel, I think it was. So they want to know where dragons came from. And this is really interesting because you see dragons shift in evolution as culture shift and technology shifts. So we see in the beginning that there was this snake that was a, so one of the earliest creation mysteries of the dragon is the world is barren. The snake comes out and carves rivers into the landscape and allows life to begin. And so, and that's called the rain snake. It makes it rain and life persists. And so our view from that is that, I mean, there's cave paintings in South Africa. We see this. Um, we've got notes of these from about 150 years ago, maybe 200 years ago, showing a snake in, in water and people around it having nosebleeds. And we also see a snake as more of a, a quadruped in water among people. So, so there's this weird story going on. Um, but then we see this snake story sort of evolve through Africa and then pop out and turn up in Asia. And in Asia, the snake is still benevolent. It's still creating water, it's creating life. And there are stories in China of sort of dragons. They've, they've turned into more dragon type features at this point, um, flying dragons. Uh, and the dragons are eventually captured and stored under mountains and they create the major rivers of China. But then what happens is 
we start seeing farming, having uh, agricultural farming. And the dragon that was giving water, obviously it stopped giving water because what now we're seeing is gods fighting the dragon and killing the dragon so it would rain. And so you have things like Vitra and Indra in uh, Hindu mythology, like Vedic culture happening, but you have all these stories in the Near East, Mesopotamia, of um, warriors killing dragons so the rain starts, the, the rivers flow. And that's sort of interesting until we get into Indo-European the mythology where they have the cows, they don't really farm crops. So the dragon there actually steals their cattle and they have to travel across lands to kill the dragon to get their cattle back. So anybody who's got cattle who isn't them is their enemy. Um, but what happens there is quite interesting. So in Persian texts, because um, everything's written as poetry. In, so in uh, our ancestors before writing, song and poetry was the way to remember stories. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just read prose, you, you'd have this rhyme or alliteration, so it's easy to remember things. So there was a lot of metaphor involved. So the, the Persians had a metaphor for um, the cows being stolen by dragons, and they called them the women who lactate milk. And that myth travelled to India and the Vedic culture, but they misread that metaphor. Uh, so rather than women or females that they lactate, um, they thought, oh, they must mean women. So they became queens. And so the dragon stopped stealing cows and started stealing queens. Mm. And then that myth travelled into Greece, and slowly, by the time you got into the Middle Ages of England, dragons were stealing princesses. So the story of a dragon stealing princess started in South Africa with the rain snake. Now, what we find is that the, as I said, we went into Asia at some point, but then it flows down into Indonesia. But it, it's still persisting some of its African form of a benevolent snake that gives life. And that is the rain, that is the rainbow serpent story as it hits Australia, because we then see at a similar time the story go into America. Um, we start seeing traces of that based on, or probabilistically. I mean, it's, it's very hard to trace that because of, the, in effect, the lack of evidence. But, but we do see occurrences of the story that gives us some acceptance because of how the snake looks and, and because they're very colourful. But if you look at these American dragons, like Chinese dragons and, and the rainbow serpent, they're colourful, where the dragons, as they come to it, Indo-Europeans have become quite dull affairs. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so so that's and that's how anyway the rainbow serpent ends up in Australia, but how the dragon myth evolves and, and turns into uh, yeah, princesses being kidnapped by dragons. Is the rainbow serpent also kidnapping queens and princesses? No, the rainbow serpent is on the dry land and letting it rain and letting animals come out of the rain, like out of the muddy ground. To live and then humans eventually sprout out and the rainbow serpent i think tells the humans you have to look after the animals and the humans didn't and then the rainbow serpent said okay well i'm going to fix everything once but if you do that again i'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth mm. so the rainbow serpent gets this end of days myth sort of planted in, in, in the minds so at the beginning of this conversation, you were saying that the serpent is the first thing that humans are afraid of. Mm -hmm. And in these myths, the serpent seems rather benevolent, creating water, creating animals, creating mm -hmm. humans. And so how do you square those two together? Okay, so that's because of the association of snakes and dragons with water. Okay, so what we see, we, we, we know from human anthropology when you look at humans humans have this ability to detect snakes subconsciously so so you can you can walk through some land and even not looking for them your eye will pick that up you, we, our eyes were designed almost to like to pick up snakes um and, you know, and we're naturally afraid of them and we naturally think they're bigger than they actually are because we're scared of them and there's been a lot of psychological work done on that and that, that was written in the Hoy's paper how that and, and so we often associate snakes with water and that's how you get the snake giving water myth you know the snake's really powerful and it's always by water so it must have made that water and in fact there's actually a very uh, interesting example it gives of two 
Paleolithic caves in Europe where snake skeletons have been found at the back of a cave where water comes out of. And, and there are hints that perhaps they're early snake rituals where people have killed a snake and put it there to stop the snake coming into blocking the water for people to use it. Um, so the association of snakes with water, yeah, has, has been going as long as, well, we, we can trace back. All right. I, I kind of want to change gears a tiny bit because mm -hmm. there's this really interesting blank spot in prehistory especially when it comes to the initiation of civilization right before that. So during the last glaciation, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to understand what human culture was like in that period. And there's all of these people who have come out right now who are very popular. I think Graham Hancock is probably the favorite. So I had to bring up Graham Hancock, uh, which is, you know, a very controversial figure on this show, probably everywhere, because, you know, we, we talk to people on the fringe, we talk to academics, and they have very different perspectives on that. Is there anything that you've gleaned in your studies of ancient mythology that points back to what the world was like during that deep prehistoric section that seems kind of blank to us before Golbeki Tape? Um, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so my first thought is that if there was an ancient civilization, let's say before the Egyptians and all this, and, and it's, they hadn't worked out the will, so just bear that in mind for anyone who thinks there is an advanced civilization out there. If they hadn't invented the will, it's very unlikely that half the stuff that should have happened happened. And you know, why build a road if there's no wheels, for example? Um, putting that to one side, uh, I guess a skeptic would say we just haven't found the wheel or something like that. Maybe, maybe yes. Well, indeed. I mean, he's a very clever man, Grant Hancock. So I have full respect for him for how he creates, because I consider him a modern myth maker. Mm. You know, he's very good at taking some truths and weaving a great story. And you know, full respect for him for doing that. You know, but, um, also not full respect because it confuses a lot of people <laughs> I'm trying to teach you know, accurate information to. Um, so what we do know pre-Ice Age I say it was very much hunter gather world. So you had to work for your food. You had to travel. You had to move. And we know people were afraid of snakes. We had people who had fire. We knew people knew about floods. So the flood myth was already a thing 40,000 years ago, certainly 30,000 years ago. The flood myth was when it truly established. And we had creation myths where we thought the world was coming from. And we, and we had these myths. We knew about the sun because of the cosmic hunt and the moon. So we had probably a vague idea of lunar cycles and, and, and the seasons. Um, and there was some access to, I won't call it farming, but we were aware of, we would follow herds of creatures around. So, uh, for example, uh, the myth of uh, Polyphemus in from Greece with the Cyclops and the animals, that's actually traced back to a, a Paleolithic uh, story from Switzerland region. Um, where so where there's a, a dwarf cyclops chasing uh, looking after goats and people are trying to steal goats from them. So if there's myths about people um, stealing goats from other people back then, then that probably was happening somewhere. You know, there, there was probably some conflict some going on about how, how to get their animals. The, tr the trouble is, obviously not only is it before writing but, uh, but, and before metals, then most of the things you're looking at are, are organic in their structure. And so there really just isn't much evidence we can use to say something is probabilistically happening in terms of specific things. All we just know, hunter-gatherers, they've got a vague idea of the world around them. We, we, we don't, don't know what Gleb Blecky Tepe was used for. Uh, we don't know what the Venus figures were used for. We don't know. The Lion Man figure I'll talk about is quite interesting because it looks like it was held a lot. So it looks like it was passed around. So it could have been some part of ritual, maybe storytelling, maybe being worshipped. But we have no idea. Um, it wasn't a child's toy. A lot of people say, oh, perhaps it was a child's toy. But if you ever hold a piece of bone that big, you realise you could probably knock out your, your sibling quite easily with that. So it probably wouldn't have been a very good toy. Um, 
at, at all. Uh, but yeah, so so there isn't really much more other than they had a basic grasp of of the cycles of the earth uh, and a basic grasp of, of what animals were dangerous and probably how they they interacted with the world. But that, uh, that's all I can tell. I certainly feel people probably far more able and intelligent than we give them credit for. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily say they were much less when you gave them an IQ test and they, they could read that. I don't think they'd be too much lower IQ than ourselves. I mean, because they, you know, they were well aware on how to grasp seasons. Actually, there's cave paintings on paper was recently started this year about, they've, uh, they believe they've interpreted cave paintings to actually show that they, there was some proto writing system saying that, um, you know, this, this animal and the number of dots reflects the number of moons it is pregnant for or the amount of time it, till it comes back from uh, migration periods. So, you know, humans are well and truly able to think about things. They just haven't developed the right tools and, and the like to, you know, to advance. That's, I mean, and that all started, say, in the Near East, when you talk about Quebecian tech, but a few, there's a, probably a few areas before that. And the thing is, we were building those before we were farming. So some people think, oh, we were farming, so we stopped. But actually, it looks like we were creating those structures and then starting to farm. And, and farming didn't happen overnight as well. Farming, it was like we were farming maybe 5% of our, our grasses, uh, maybe 15,000 years ago, and then 10% 13,000 years ago, and then 20% 11,000 years ago, and then 50% 9,000 years ago. So it, it took a while to us to, to work out how that happened. And we, and we see that. So when those farmers then come into Europe, we see they get, they arrive in Greece around 6,000 BCE. Um, but it takes them another thousand years to go from Greece to Germany because they come across trees and hills. And they're not used to trees and hills, you know, in, in, on the coast of Turkey and, and, and the Near East. So it, it takes them a while to work out, oh, actually, we've got to chop trees down and build log buildings and things like that. And yet then the proto in the Europeans had the same problem. You see them migrate to Europe and then stop because they don't know what to do with the landscape. Takes them a thousand years or so, and then they can come onto the landscape. And so that's really interesting because that landscape obviously has to influence myths. We see environment and, and social needs influence myth a lot. So it, what would be quite interesting to that is to understand how did that European environment change the myths? And, and that's really hard to grasp parts of that. Mm. Do you, there's this really strange blank spot between Gobekli Tape and you know, the 6,000 BC mark where you start to see other cities popping up. Do you have any sense from the mythology of what was going on in those 3,000 years? Um, I don't think it's as blank as you realize. What's okay. happened is the sea level's risen 50 meters or so in that time. And so we, we've seen a whole heap of uh, Stone Age buildings, along certainly along the coast of Israel, on the Mediterranean, all underwater now. Mm. So, I mean, coastal places were seem to be a lot happening on coastal places. Uh, I don't know, probably it's easier to find where you are and, and, and track and, and trace and there's good sources of food. So, and, and Stone Age buildings have been going since about 15,000 years ago. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think much has changed apart from perhaps the the change from, to change to farming and it might be that the farming maybe influenced going from a big sort of ritual complex to a lot of houses and so you see this sort of evolution of settlement types that then evolve into the cities like Jericho um which is our sort of I think it's our oldest continuously populated city but there's some other some older uh cities uh on the border of Syria and, and Turkey I believe um about 10,000 11,000 years old maybe slightly older so yeah there, there are things there that just I say they're, they're probably you know quite easily have been under the sea or maybe just hidden because Quebec tepes on the other tepes were, were were well some people think they were buried but I think the latest archaeological information is they were just naturally filled in um, over time so yeah I don't think it's quite that blank but what is blank is there doesn't seem to be much cultural evolution that we can grasp we see some animals on stone columns in Gobekli Tepe, and then we see things like the Mesopotamian gods in the Enuma Elysian, the Epic Gilgamesh, 
you know, 6,000 years or 7,000 years later. And it's like, well, how did you go from that to, to that? And, and agricultural agriculture is the thing that happened. It's like we need gods now. We're not hunter-gathering anymore. We need gods that are here in our city. So perhaps they had the shape of people because you start thinking, ah, oh, it's people who are important now. It's not nature. So you see a personification of gods and, and you see the dragon myth change into our chief god has to kill the dragon to get the water. But you also start seeing the the gods. So uh, in the Enuma Elish, which is the uh, Sumer creation myth and Babylonian creation myth, you see uh, Marduk uh, kill Tiamat and use his body to create the world, something you then see in Indo-European mythology you know, a little later on. Um, so, yeah, you, you start... Yeah, there's that evolution. In, uh, that, and I think all that's happened is that whoever was in Sumer or, or Babylon or that, or that area on the Tigris, Euphrates, and there, that culture is the one that's probably is most influential in the religions we now see today. Mm. But, but I say it's very hard to say. I mean, it must have been quite a rapid change, I'd imagine. I imagine every couple of generations they were tweaking the religion because you know, you're, you're having an agricultural revolution going on I mean, things were completely changing so i'd imagine that is, is what is happening so that's why we perhaps haven't got much trace of that and in fact we see some evidence of that later on so the old testament for example comes from ugaritic texts so for so um there's a site which is slightly older than uh the the hebrew sites um which which we found Texts that are actually used in the Old Testament, but earlier versions when the, the, the myths are slightly changed. And so you can actually see that the Hebrews have used these older texts, and these older texts have perhaps some of them have come from Mesopotamia, some have come from Egypt. So you are seeing a lot of transfer of culture. Um, but as I say, we're just missing that. As you say, it seems like a, a, a gap, but they're, they're, they're something must be around there. We just haven't found it yet. And say, but underwater is perhaps one of the best places to look. Mm -hmm. so there's no chance of finding archaeology, I'd imagine, like um, organic materials there. It's, it's interesting, too, that you mentioned there's this stepwise progression towards treating God as a person, and which eventually terminates in this mono, this monism, this monotheism. Yeah, monotheism yeah. What do you make of that stepwise progression towards monotheism? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So, I've got to be honest. I think the Abrahamic religion did a really good job at making a a good religion that people would like, which is why it succeeded. I mean, it did change a lot. There's a huge change between the Jewish religion and Christianity. You know, Christianity got rid of the circumcision, got rid of the need to go to church. And you know, heaven forbid you did commit sins in your life, all you had to say is, please forgive me the day before you died, and you know, you're going off to heaven. You know, it's a bargain in terms of religious thought. <laughs> so, yeah, they, 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 they did a really good job. But what they did with their myth was quite clever. They made it canonical. So what you find is that the myths of the Near East and and, and which travelled all the way through Cyprus with the Phoenicians and across into Europe and the Greeks, those myths could be recycled. You could see the same myth that's told in Babylon and told uh, in Phoenicia and told in by the Hittites is told in Greece with just different names. But the basic myth was the same. But they people have personalised it to their culture. The Bible, because they made it canonical and this happened then and this happened then, and you can't take that and tweak it around it has to stay as it is and so that story stayed as it is and they were really clever so the very first two lines of the bible which are about in the beginning uh god created a world and basically you see him he, he floats across the water in the, in the deep it says well those two lines are a synopsis of the enuma elish which is the creation myth of the babylonians so what they've done is they've taken the creation myth put in a couple of lines, and when you start telling that story back then, everybody go, well, this sounds familiar. So they hook you, and then they suddenly change the story, say, oh, and then there was God. And like he said, you know, let there be light, let there be the sun and the earth, and all these things happened, which are quite Egyptian-type creation uh, motifs, by the way. So, yeah, they're, they're, and that's what's happened. You see, uh, certainly in the first few chapters of Genesis, there are Egyptian and Mesopotamian motifs, coming together so Adam's made twice 
in Genesis and creation sort of happens twice in Genesis because they're using both sets of motifs. And in terms of the staying power of the Judeo-Christian myths, is that the first time that you see this kind of canonical representation that is held in place, or are there earlier versions? There was one earlier version in, in Egypt, but that didn't work out so well for the pharaoh. I, believe. What was it? I can't remember his name. Egyptology isn't my, my special subject, but I, I'm aware there was a pharaoh who had monotheistic ideas and mm. uh, changed a bit of myth, and uh, yeah, yeah, that didn't work out too well. I mean, Egypt was was so successful, in my opinion, because it was quite isolated, so could have a persistent mythology and a you know, persistent view, and that's why they came out so strong. But yeah, so that way may well have influenced that one pharaoh that people try that again. Um, but but there's still, there is stuff in the uh, writings in the Bible which hint at um, polytheism. You know, we see Certainly, in uh, like the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and earlier scripts, that you know, God is a a child of or son of a another god, Elion. And Elion dishes out land and gives uh, God Israel, in effect. So, so we actually see that happening. That's in Deuteronomy, I think. Hmm. I I was going to say that there is this sense from myths that I get that most of the myths are universally applicable to humans and there's not really this differentiation between children and adults like the children that appear in myths are adult like and do you think that that's a reflection of the the culture or do you think that that is just incidental i think that is a reflection of the people who wrote the myths or who remember the myths and told them so i think it was very male dominated Judging by the, the myths and what the other you know, subject matter, I don't, yeah. So, um, whilst it may seem a stereotypical view of an ancient man, but perhaps they weren't so interested in what the kids and, and the wife was doing. They're more interested in slaying dragons and and avoiding dying. Interesting. Yeah, I, I want to, uh, yeah, just just one more idea on the monotheism it's interesting that it seems like this stepwise evolution towards monotheism but in the modern age it seems like this per, not just monotheism but personification of a human being a form of a human taking on godlike abilities which is in some sense working so hard against modern the the appeal of religion right now with all of our rationality and it's just very hard for modern people to stomach the idea of a person up there pulling strings, right? And exactly. and it's just so to me, it's just so ironic that that would be the evolution would would both make the gods relatable by personifying them, but then ultimately that's what turns people off at the end of the day. Now it didn't back then. I mean, now if you say you know, draw a picture of Jesus. If you ask, you ask North North American citizens to draw picture of Jesus and they, and they averaged it out, I'm pretty sure he's going to be a white male in his 40s, maybe with a bit of a beard. You go to the Near East and do it, he's, he's probably going to look a bit different. You know, if you go to South America and do it, he's going to look a bit different. So, yeah, and that's the problem now because we are a global world. We can start seeing these sort of contradictions in, in this. But back then, I don't think that was such a... Yeah, you know, it really occurred to people so much. But then again, you're also saying, do people really think the gods existed? I mean, I'm, I'm sure the Greeks didn't think they climbed Mount Olympus; they would bump into Zeus. But so, it's just such an interesting hinge, right? That that yeah. that change to literalism is so fascinating. Do you know who James Tour is, the the scientist? By any chance, James Tour. He, no, he's a, I mean, he's a very, he's one of the most well-published scientists of our age, but he's also a diehard Christian and okay. literalist Christian. We had him on the show the other day and we were just trying to dance around this issue of literalism and why it's so important to him and why it's so important to some group of people. But it also seems to work against them because that's the most difficult part of adopting these ideas. And I don't know, I still come down on the side of like, it's kind of working against the greater purpose of these religions, which is really to tie you into a sense of purpose in your landscape, essentially, or in your society. And 
I don't know. I just wonder wh- where, how, where that came from. So, so to me, so, so we have a definition for myth and when we're in mythology. So it isn't just a, a fairy tale. A myth is basically a, a story that has a sacred truth. And that's the important bit. So that means there be some people who believe whatever God or culture is embedded with it, within that myth, they believe that to be true. So, and, and for mythologists like me, we know they're just myths. Yeah. And, and, sacred truth. and so that is, but that is what makes it special. There's this faith there where this literal world, as you say, you lose that sacred truth in a way. Because everything that's happening today can't be, it doesn't make sense that it's sacred it, it, you, 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 because you're living it. It's, there's no magic there or whatever you want to call religion. You know, it is supernatural essence or whatever. So, yes, I understand it. That, is, that must be, it's, I don't know, it just loses that. I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you can think like that. It loses its meta power, right? Mm, Because it's almost like myths are there. You know, I've heard Jordan Peterson say this before too, that in some sense, these myths are more real than reality because they are the sum of so many shared experiences over the ages, right? It's like, if you behave this way, then this will happen. And it, it does play out in so many little tiny ways that it seems like the fixation on the literal interpretation of any myth is just completely missing the points like exactly i've I've just i've had so many frustrating conversations with fundamentalists where i'm just like you know there's an awesome uh per- perfect circle the the a tool side project band that's like about this where it's like if you like stop talking about these things and live these things like stop preaching to me about Jesus and live like Jesus, you know, like, and it seems like that's the tragedy with, with the literal interpretation is that you get fixated on, on the fine structure of the myth, as opposed to actually the broad strokes of what means. the teaching is giving you. But is that because everybody is asking you to prove <laughs> you know, the, your literal religion, you know, and you're spending so much time doing that, you forget to live your religion. Yeah. Or just proving that's, it out by being like, well, you know, don't you uh, feel like you're nailed to a cross every day sometimes? You know, that kind of thing, right? Which, you know, there's there's ways of proving out the stories in a very real sense that have nothing to do with digging up artifacts of this mm. event from the past or something. Is there, a, is there a time where you can see the transition towards literalism? Because you said that in ancient Greece, there wasn't a sense that you could walk down the street and run into Zeus. And mm. it, there was Mount Olympus where the gods lived, but was there the idea that you could go there and find them? Or was it always no, this no. place that was unreachable? Well, th- this is, I think, where some people got into trouble. So some of the philosophers where they started to ask these questions. Um, but no, I don't think many people thought you would, Zeus would be actually physically living on top of Olympus. They may have thought he may have appeared there. Maybe if you asked him to turn up, otherwise he would be wherever he is. They certainly thought they were up high. You know, there was a difference between us on the ground and up in up high, and and that is reflected in biblical stories too. And that's no coincidence. I mean, the people who wrote the Gospels uh, were were taught Greek classics. <laughs> yeah, how to write the the, the Gospels were written in Greek initially. So you know, they they knew these stories, and you that's possibly one of the reasons why there are similarities between. Some of the you know some of the verses in the Iliad and the Odyssey as there are in in the New Testament, um, but yeah, I, I don't think I, I think the world certainly for those general, well generally the world is moving away from religion. I, I think it's, it's that's quite clear. People, however, I think civilization has grown up with religion so much that's going to be a hard habit to break. But certainly in America, I don't, you know because. Yet there's a reputation that America is, is is quite fundamentalist in terms of its religious views. It's, it's, you know, it's just one of your favourite toys, as Christopher Hitchens would say. Um, it, yes, you know, certainly in, in Europe, it's it's very different. Actually, there, there is there is some movement towards some of the more traditional religions, I guess, rather than just a complete you know, move towards atheism. And that's quite interesting, and I think that's perhaps people are looking for. You know, more attachment with nature and, you know, and, and with the world rather than, you know, 
believing that it worried about a God and going to heaven. They're more worried about living a good life. I mean, it seems like that's so significant because if the gods are part of nature and they live in the trees and they live in the water and they live in the hills, you have a very different obligation to those places and to those objects than you do to gods that don't live in the worlds, that live somewhere else, which you might achieve at some point in the afterlife. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. Um, I haven't really thought of it like that, but yeah, that's, that's it. I'm, I'm sure that, yeah, you have that. Yeah, and that's, well, say Christianity or some of the Abrahamic religions have been well molded to be popular, not necessarily to, to necessarily be good religions. And you've got to ask yourself, why is that? Is it because they, they have a they want a good business model and earn money? I don't know. I'm, well, I, they do. They do earn money really well because the Pope lives in possibly the fanciest house that I've ever seen. <laughs> exactly, in a very nice city. Yeah, but oh, exactly. Um, and you have to think about it. So, in I'm sure there is money involved. You know, helps the world go around. Well, the, the winnowing of God from animal to man exclusively mm. is a fascinating transition because mm. when God is diffuse and in the landscape, you can't possibly extract the way that colonialism did or the way that capitalism does because you are committing a venial sin against the world itself. And mm. so it feels like it is this trip. Maybe that's why I'm so skeptical of it, right? Because literalism suggests that God lives only in the human and it's the abandonment of animism and of the, the respect to animals that humans in these older structures appeared to have. And so it almost seems reasonable for there to be a reawakening of these nature centered religions because that's the only way that we can possibly make it through the era that we're living in, which is to say, well, hold on a second. There's no animals. There's no, there's just us. And that's not a world that we necessarily want to live in because it's so, it's so hollow. Like I think all the time about what it must have been like to be able to go out into the woods or to live in the woods and to see the way that animals lived on the landscape. And then to be able to take these deep lessons from nature and then to translate them onto ourselves. But when you live in this vacuum where you look around and the only thing that you ever see is humans or animals that you have domesticated, which then depend on you, it fundamentally changes the way that you think. Mm. Yeah, like I wonder if there's a cyclicity to this, like if we'll make a full circle and go and return to it because like one of the things um, Michael Hudson, the economist we just had on the show, we're releasing uh, the second part of that conversation this week we get into what he imagines as a more functional economy and what a more functional state would look like. And it's hard to imagine a really functional state without an overarching ideology that actually did reinforce values that were pro-ecological, pro-interconnection, pro-human, really, as well. And so it's like, I wonder if there was a mythology that was able to make a comeback in the future, in the modern world, in the future world, future modern you know if that well, what that would look like if it would just go full circle it may, it may be different again because there's some people saying that ai will be a new religion mm. and chat gpt it's, it's got the answers for everyone um but yes yes i i mean one of the one of the things i get from studying mythology and certainly in the european mythology uh, and i'm not I wouldn't call myself religious is I do like some of those beliefs of the culture, such as this cyclical nature. You, know, you shouldn't take more from the world than you give, and I think that's good. Uh, yeah, that, that works. But they had another thing. I, I, I talk about my channel sometimes. They have a, a poetic phrase, which is, um, in, in effect, it says, "You should lead your best life, uh, and you won't, and you will never die." In effect, fame does not decay. Is what they call it. So if you do good things, people always talk about your name. And that's what it was about. They those people didn't worship God every day. They didn't have to go to church every week. You know, they didn't have to certainly the the, the very the, the earlier hunter gatherers, you know, didn't didn't have rituals all, all the time. They just lived their life and and thought the gods made the world happen, whatever they did. You couldn't necessarily influence them. 
And I like that idea, you know, that the, the gods had their own world and doing whatever they are. And you know, we're, we're just should be grateful that we're part of that world and not try and influence them. That's a very human thing to do. And aiming up, right? There's some, there's like a, there's a way to read the New Testament that's where you, you see this prophet as essentially coming in and trying to eradicate the police, priest class in some sense, or just supplanting them and being like, you don't actually need this middleman. You really just need to live with charity and love and these basic human upward aims in order to create a more perfect society. And of course, that got turned into a religion by the priest class and so forth. But it's, fundamentally, well, there's almost... It. Oh, you missed the esoteric purpose of the Gospels. It, I mean, it's so revolutionary in a sense, if you think about it, right? But it, of course, it was turned into the same bureaucratic nightmare as any other religion very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I say, I only succeeded because the entry requirements were very flexible. They let families in, women in, no circumcision, no having to go to a temple. You know, it was far better than Judaism, better than Mithraism. Uh, There's no secret rituals you had to go through to, to 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 join. Why wouldn't you join it? It's um so yeah, it was a uh, very much man-made. I wonder, uh, what do you make of the giant myths? The giant myths, yes. So giants aren't big. That's the first thing. Giants can be. Hmm. Just a meter high, they can be twenty meters high. Um, and we see this in mythology that the the giants we perceive are very much a folk tale, middle aged folk tale type thing. So, where this seems to have come from, because these tales are they're told in quite a lot of places, but certainly in in Europe, they seem to come from uh, areas that are um, certainly dominated by or, or have Indo European influence layered on top of agricultural farming influence. Uh, so by that, you see a mix of cultures. And I think what's happening with giants is that giants are a way to explain why certain things have been built by previous cultures we don't understand. And so a, a real typical example is like a, a, a stone circle or something like that. They say Stonehenge. You come across Stonehenge. Who could have built that? They're big stones. must have been giants. Um, but you also get it where there are talking about wars with people. So we find in uh, a lot of cultures, there are stories of conflict. So in the Scandinavian uh, mythology or the pantheons, you have the the Aesir and the Venir, who are the two god types. And the Aesir tend to be sort of warrior, Indo-European-esque type gods, and the Venir tend to be agricultural, lovey, fertility gods. You get this this break and you in this sort of you get similar things happening in, in Greece with the Titans and and the gods and and in India uh, and and in, in Iran as well and there may have been some of that too that there was a conflict before and these people were strong or big but what it isn't is I mean many people say oh that perhaps they were referring to Neanderthals because Neanderthals were bigger than us and what people don't understand is one the length of time back to Neanderthals is quite significant. But also, when we went from hunter-gathering to agricultural farming, our bodies shrank a bit because we weren't getting the same types of nutrition as you were as hunter-gatherers. As hunter-gatherers, there's a lot of protein you know, and, 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 and fruit and the like. When you started eating grasses, we actually see a, a physical uh, reduction in the size of the human body. So it could be that it's agricultural farmers seeing hunter gatherers mm. that they, you, know, you may get a difference. I mean, you will get you know, outliers all the time, you know, to tall people, but I think there may be a bit of that too, but much of it is around explaining sort of what would have been unexplainable. I like that. Can you trace back mythology to the, the birth of language as well? Do you think that myth and language happened at the same time? Uh, that's hard to say because no one knows when language started. There has been work done to try and find out oldest words. Uh, and the results of that study was the things like, yes, me, you, I are the oldest words, but also fire. I know it wasn't fire. It was worm and ash. Those two words 
were amongst mm-hmm. the eldest. And Worm's interesting because Worm, uh, in effect, meant dragon or serpent. Mm. So, and Ash means there's fire going on. I mean, no fire was was being used a lot. So, uh, it's hard to know. I mean, certainly there's there's a finding recently about Homo uh, Nadali uh, having perhaps a burial ritual in Africa, three hundred fifty thousand years old. Um, if there is a ritual burial going on which requires multiple people, then they must have been communicating somehow. And so, so my view on burial rituals is that if you're deliberately digging a pit and you're deliberately positioning a body in the pit, then chances are there's ritual going on. And if you put a grave good in the pit, I'm very much certain you're thinking something's happening to this body once you've buried it. So, uh, and if that's happening, if you've only got a myth going on in your head and you can't talk about it, is it a myth? Mm. What does it, and, and is that the difference in a myth and religion where you need a more of a communal aspect for everybody to think the same thing? So perhaps myths may have been going on for our earliest burial rituals, but religion perhaps didn't start happening until we were able to talk mm. more effectively mm. and share that ritual behavior with people. Yeah, so so I almost think burials. Sorry, I, I almost think about there being two births of humanity, right? There's the anatomically modern human, which can be. Mm trace back but then it seems to me like the fundamental thing about being a human is that we can speak we're able to wield sounds in this incredibly symbolic way and it's even if we're not speaking it's going on in our heads like you said this is the way that we come up with new ideas is we arrange ideas using symbolic speech essentially and it's almost like i wonder if some of these very early creation myths and i i often think about the adam and eve story this way if it isn't pointing to this event where humans learned how to command the word for the first time That's because interesting. it seems to me like the most primitive and powerful technology that we still have in place today that allows us to do everything we can do is this ability to just shape sounds into symbolic into symbols that are tra- easily transmitted, yeah. Um, yes, so that's, uh, yeah, that is interesting. I'm just trying to think of it anyway. So we can't, because we, we can never know when we started talking. But I mean, it is said, that, and I agree, that to be human is to be able to tell stories. Telling stories is what makes us human. I, I totally agree that that would have changed everything. Um, we, so the Hoy, who I talked about earlier, who, who started the dragon ritual hit. So, and I was, it may have been Witz, actually, no, it's Witzel, Michael Witzel, who's Harvard. Uh, he talked about the creation myth and, uh, he, he talks about sort of how early this could be. And so some of the creation myths we got are, involve, say, the surf diver where mud comes to the top of the sea and the, the mud hits the top of the sea, land is created. And then often a tree shoots out of the land and humans come from the underground out of the tree and populate the world. And this is time before there, and there are no gods at this point in time. You know, humans haven't thought about gods. Um, and he believes that story goes back possibly even 130, 140,000 years. Whoa. So if that story, which has some complexity in it, goes back that far, then that's probably as early as we can go. Now, De Hoy was saying he may be able to go back and maybe try and pick up stories from Neanderthals or, or the, an earlier human species. I don't know if he can. He's, he's cleverer than I by a long time. How does he establish those anyway. dates? How do you just peg a number on something like that? Well, it, 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 I think it's to do with evolution language and the stories. So if if a story changes, you know, some time must have gone on for it to change, and it depends how it's changed. If the mythogems are the same, but the whole sort of packaging of the story is different, then there's a longer period of time gone on between the two, then if the package of the story is very similar and the myth of the gems are similar. So it may be that in a particular area, he's seen such differentiation, he can then make an estimate on it. As I say, it's all probabilistic. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, we, we slap, we normally put, a, say, slap a 70,000 year figure on it. Uh, but any story that comes from Africa, we tend to say 70,000 years. But the fact is, the story didn't start as they were jumping across the peninsula into well, it's now Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. Chances are they were telling the story for at least a 
5,000 years before that, maybe 10,000 years. So maybe even 30,000, 40, we just don't know. And that is, that is one of the real problems I, I have because I, I get so many people saying, oh, Africa has the oldest stories. Africa has the oldest religion. Africa has the oldest art. But there's just no evidence of it. Not that it wasn't there. I'm sure it could have been. But as an academic, I can't say definitely because there's nothing – I can show you that says that, and that is really frustrating. So it isn't that I don't like not talking about Africa? It's just there isn't much I can talk about. I mean, it's only sort of in the last six thousand years you can start getting sort of more decent evidence um, about what's going on on there. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge to say how far back we go. Well, I have this feeling that the emergence of myth in the record is distinct from the emergence of myth in the mind. And I've told this story before on the podcast, but we were in the woods once and there was an airplane that passed overhead and then a bunch of baby coyotes started howling at it. And obviously it's, you know, you you can map it as being just a misunderstanding of what is happening and they're reacting to the sound. But there's also this other part of me that's like, well, If we evolve from animals, animals are conscious of the world around them and they're reacting to things and they're seeing them. And it seems like these cultural understandings of large events must predate any ability to speak about them and if they or write about them. And if that is the case, then the roots must go back to animals. But because we have no way of codifying language in animals we haven't some people even think that animals aren't conscious like we come across this on the podcast all the time somebody will be like you know i think my cat might be conscious and it's like well that's that's a stunning statement and so there there must be something that reaches deeper that is emergent from nature that then humans codify in the way that we recognize and so any study of what is the origin of myth is really the study of the origin of language and record keeping and continuous archaeological record rather than the study of true origin. I think that might be what you're encountering when people say that these myths come from Africa. And it's like, well, maybe. But the only thing that we can look at is the texts or the artifacts. Exactly. I mean, or, yeah, but there's, there's no record done. I mean, we're quite lucky, as bad as colonization was, there were some scientists who were part of these parties and taking notes and we rely on those so we rely on 300 year old stories written down by people who, who first came across the first nation americans for example and write down their stories and yeah we've got a whole plethora of those that we can use to before they were polluted by modern western thoughts and ideas or or by christian conversion which you know, affects a lot of stories but also they're quite easy to identify so we can tell with stories have been changed in more remote parts of the world because of sort of Christian conversion techniques or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, Af- Af- yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are, Africa is, is, is a, is a challenge, but the, the point you raise is quite interesting in the sense that, you know, behaviorally, for example, chimpanzees would be scared of snakes. And we talked about the snake myth, you know, it's, it's a, the primates, all mammals, in fact, all mammals are scared of snakes. That is inherent within our brain. So, are we saying that the snake myth started as soon as we, an individual animal, realized to be scared of a snake? So there's a really incredible video of uh, chimpanzees in an enclosure, and there's a fake snake inside of the enclosure, and the chimp who first finds the snake freaks out, then realizes that the snake isn't real, and then picks it up and starts scaring the other chimps with it. Wow. And I'm like, that's the, I, I, you can say that it's an artifact of the fact that they're inside of an enclosure, but I'm like, there has to be something that we are missing because of our lack of interaction with animals. Mm. And because all of our anthropological and scientific body of work comes in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution and the mm. Enlightenment, what we have is a story with missing pieces because it's so hard to study animals in the wild. And so Mm. few people are willing to devote their lives to it to actually understand what's happening, where I feel like a a truer and more complete story of the emergence of 
human consciousness and myth making has to start somewhere earlier. Because if a chimp can scare Absolutely. other chimps with a snake, what is a myth except for a tool to scare others into the proper behavior? Exactly. I mean, and, and chimps have emotion. We see chimps mourning the death of, of one of their party. Um, we, we see chimps take part in ritual behavior. Chimps use tools. So, yeah, there's something going on in their heads. And if they're all thinking the same thing and reacting to sounds, is that a myth? Yeah. It's it's a it's a proto myth. Like there's proto myth, yes. Right, and so I just mm. I don't know. I think that there's there's a wealth of stuff there that just is beyond our ability to really study it using the tools of of science. I've got my eyes yeah. on the whales. I'm really really interested because they they know that the yes. whales have these very complex songs that change, and they mm -hmm. they have dialects and they change from season to season, but they keep parts of the past, and it it really has that flavor. Of, of mythology to it. And I mean, it yeah. could be a complete coincidence, right? Of course, this is one of the like most terrible parts of the scientific method is that you can only use the pieces of evidence that are on the table to tell the story, right? And you can kind of slot in hypotheses to fill the gaps, but the more that your story is built on hypotheses, the less interesting like it is. It's a probabilistic thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And the way also interesting, though, because I'm pretty sure in the 1800s and, and the whales certainly North Atlantic, behaved differently when they realized whaling ships were around. They they they, they migrated differently or bounced up differently. I'm sure there's some stories around that, you know, and, and that's quite interesting. How do they know that and how do they communicate with each other to act in exactly the same way? Mm -hmm. Or do they just follow one person? And that's, I say, that's what you're saying, the, the evidence isn't, clear yeah there's something crazy going on right now i don't know if you guys have seen this in the with the orcas yeah the orcas are attacking ships all of a sudden yes yeah the others are the ships yeah i mean orcas are very clever very clever animals indeed so um who knows perhaps they i don't know it's uh it reminds me of douglas adams uh Pitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy wrote so long and thanks for the fish mm. where you know, they knew the world was going to get blown up and the dolphins like jumped off into space and it's almost like this, the orcas are just trying to stop us polluting the world more. And yeah, I don't know. That's uh, yeah, but that, that, is, that is really interesting behavior. So what are the questions that you are most preoccupied now? Because you have this body of work that's on your YouTube channel. You're saying that you're going to devote yourself more and more to it progressively. Are there big open questions that you haven't been able to tackle yet that you really want to? I want to put clarification in some questions. So I want to uh, take another look at the Indo-European creation myth. Uh, the, the last time that was really looked at was about 50 years ago by Bruce Lincoln. And I, I want to take that apart and give a, a, a more decent analysis and to distinguish agricultural motifs from Indo-European motifs. Because uh, it, it's really interesting how the in uh to the early european farmers neolithic farmers their myths came from the east and i'd like to build up a picture of that one of the other things i'm doing i've created something called the mythology database uh, and that has i've translated uh a database that was in russian called burzkin's database which basically has around thirty thousand myths in it um and with geographical information and we can use that so if you have a motif you can look on there and it shows how it was spread and who's telling those stories and that's really useful for us to see if things are linked or not linked so I've, I've, I've translated that and i've added many many folk tales and myths to that database so it's hopefully it will become the largest repository of mythology and folklore information on the internet that's one of the other big projects wow. uh, i'm really going for and where is that located mythologydatabase.com Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, can't forget that. Um, uh, and then I just want to write a couple more books on Indo-European culture so people sort of understand the religion a bit more because I see people trying to practice traditional religions. You see um, modern versions, it's like Asa Tru, uh, they call it, so sort of Scandinavian Viking type stuff, but I want to be more generic and just trying to, to communicate what, what the culture is like because – We've lost how the rituals were performed, how the beliefs were, but if I can give people better information on what was going on, they may be able to better inform their rituals, be more like those traditional religions. And although I'm not, as I say, religious, I, I believe some good can become 
and come from being more in touch with with the world as we were mm. touching on earlier so that's really it you know a couple of books and the, the mythology database and sounds like you have your work cut out for you thank you yeah and then uh, before you jump off the phone uh, again if you uh if you do f- uh think you're going to be in town in, in austin next year it would be really cool to have you come by and, and give a talk absolutely i mean if you've enjoyed this and you enjoy my work i'm, I'm sure we can make that happen that won't be a problem it'd be fantastic so, yeah, if i'm in america it's no problem hopping down to austin that, so. that excellent okay so April just 6th, let me know. We'll do, do i just email you on the email address i've got for you guys yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we'll be in that. touch for sure and then uh yeah. okay yeah I think that it's really valuable work that you do because, like you said, the ability to be in touch with something that is larger than ourselves, I think, is the is the mark of a healthy spirit. Because if you live in a position where all that you have is this plane, then I think that there's a there's a yearning that never gets answered. And people become progressively more rational and they become isolated from the emotional context of all of these stories. Exactly. And so finding ways to to reignite that, I think, is really valuable for the world. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank, well, thank you for wanting to talk to me. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's appreciate it. It's been really fun. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope to do it again. I hope we can, let, we can catch up again. Yeah, well, I'm pretty flexible. So if you ever want a, a little piece for your Patreon or whatever, just ask and I'm happy to tell a story or dive into a particular kind of myth if you want. That's no problem. Thanks, Fantastic. John. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. All right, have a great rest of your day. We'll be in touch. Yeah, you take care. All right, see you. Thank okay. you.